Chapter 11 It Ain't the Arrows, It's the Archer I have yet to notice a golf club manufacturer using plutonium shafts as a means to achieve longer and straighter drives and or lower scores. In fact, plutonium and uranium remain the only EM ending words that golf club marketers have not used to entice golf consumers to replace their clubs as often as they do their iPhones, or in some cases, their wives. The EM craze seems to have started in the 80s with titanium, maybe to coincide with the end of the Cold War. Was there a titanium bomb? Fiberglass was in the picture back then, but I think it was for the seniors and ladies. The top money winners of the time were still swinging steel, although many had gone to cavity back heads. Wooden drivers and spoons had all but disappeared by the early 90s. Back then, the recreational player was a different animal and was the key focus for the above-mentioned marketers. No self-respecting top money winner was switching equipment based on an ad in Golf Digest, but it seemed that any word ending in I-U-M and any color other than silver had an immediate and almost Pavlovian effect on the average golf enthusiast. In most cases, prices for titanium clubs were two or three times that of steel, and since the steel was reduced to go, the difference only increased by the hour. Back at the golf club of Plantation, we had a number of everyday players with far more cash than game, and all of them were convinced that the impurities of their game were not swing-related, but rather a direct and obvious result of equipment not properly suited for their game. There was one guy in particular. We called him Sweetness, because first and foremost, his last name was Sweet, and just as importantly, he was one of the plain old nicest guys any of us had ever known. If I walked into the club on any given day and saw him deeply engrossed in a golf magazine, I could be positive that by no later than the next day there would be an empty Callaway or Mizuna carton sticking out of a trash can and the contents of the empty box would be tucked into his bag, or quite possibly a brand new bag. If the new equipment had been used that day, he would make the results available at the bar with lines such as pure striking, perfect fit, and distances defying physics and mathematics. His handicap was 15, but a decent 9 could and would beat him like a drum almost every round, and usually did. His swing was borderline unfixable in my opinion, and his putting game was about the same, although on occasion he'd bring forth a surprisingly decent stroke, which kept the handicap under 20. Let's go to the bar and get a full report. Murph, I heard as I came into sight, you saved a fortune today just by not having a game with me. I would have beat you four ways without presses. He was holding the card over his head and was smiling from ear to ear. Why had I known I would hear that? Let me guess, I quickly replied. You got new clubs. Did you shoot that 66 you've been promising? No, it wasn't the elusive 66, but an 86, which was a career low for him and had probably won him a hundred or more in $5 and $10 bets. Sweetness had, in fact, bought new clubs and was going to run up a $150 bar tab because of the great deal he had gotten and how his entire golf game had changed. Since golf was his life, well, what more could there be? He'd passed on buying the bag, but had picked up the custom-fitted irons for a smooth 685 after a trade-in on his one-year-old set. I remembered that particular iron purchased by Sweetness the prior year. It had been just north of 400, and he had firmly decided it would change his game. In baseball, there's a great feat known as hitting for the cycle. It is rare, and my best guess is that many an MLB season has passed with no player completing a single, double, triple, and homer in the same game. Like many of us, I had an occasion to sell cars for a short period, which also had its own hit for the cycle feat. As I listened to my man Sweetness relate each of his 86 shots, all the time referring to the new sticks, I could not help thinking of the golf equipment salesman who had hit for the cycle with him. In my mind, the world-class transaction probably went something like single. Sales guy sold the new set at full price, save for the trade-in allowance for the irons. Double. Sales guy probably unloaded those irons before the close of business at two or three times the allowance he had so generously offered. Triple. In two days, Sweetness would return to the store to not only expound on the fantastic clubs, but to pick up the bag he'd passed on and to grab those New York Giants head covers. Homer. In three to six months, my man would be back with the new issue of Golf World and you know the rest. I'd be flattered to know that the readership of this book might include some of the folks who make or market some of the above-referenced golf club brands. 
Maybe they're even gathering their suits and legal staff to give me a sound thrashing for so much as implying that their equipment is not anything other than beneficial to improving the game of most players. Hear me out before you rush to judge. If I spend more than five bills for a new set of clubs and find myself about to fire a seven iron for the first time, my thought process is most definitely going to involve everything I have spent thousands through lessons learning to do. The tempo, the grip, the head position, the follow through, all are going into that swing and the odds of a positive result will have been improved enormously. Whack. Holy shit, these clubs are fucking great. The flight path, the divot, the perfect distance. The term sweetness just took on a whole new meaning, and it's there to stay. The day before, with my old clubs, when faced with pretty much the same shot, my attitude would probably have been, I stink, I hate this 7-iron, I need new grips, and I am two down with no chance of getting this ball in the green. The truth is, a positive thinking process happens with new clubs. It's that simple. The romance of the new equipment continues for a while, possibly even many months. Sadly, it will fade due to lack of confidence after we play a few shitty rounds and fall back into the same old bad habits. As for the Homer part of the above hitting for the cycle scenario, that's when our hero Sweetness spots a two-page color spread on the newest combination of heads and shafts not yet known to man but endorsed by more touring pros than he could name after three vodkas. When he goes back to the same store that bailed him out earlier... The salesman is not only there, but boy, does he have a deal. You think?